Good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome. We'd like to welcome you today to the Flint Community Webinar on Coronavirus this Friday, October 22nd. This is our 84th webinar, and we are excited to be able to bring to you information that we trust will, make sh will benefit you today. This webinar is brought to you by the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center, the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions, and the Prevention Research Center. We, have been, we are now streaming live, so for all of you that are able, please join. send a note to someone and have them join us on YouTube. We thank you for that. Have them join us on Facebook as we continue to provide this incredible information to you. We have an exciting opportunity for you today. Every week we bring to you information that we hope that you'll be able to share with others. I am your moderator today, Yvonne Lewis, and look forward to you joining us by sharing in the chat. Please put your questions in the Q&A. If you are joining us by phone or by YouTube, you can uh, team up with us by sending your questions in to info at hfrcc.org, or you can give us a call at 810-835-2130. And for those of you that are joining us, if you have questions, please remember to put those questions in the Q&A. Use that little button down at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists are here to answer questions for you as appropriate. Some questions will also be asked during the webinar, so please feel free to put those questions in. We want to acknowledge and appreciate those of you that continue to share the value, valuable information from the webinars. I've heard from some of you this week that you're taking this information for yourself personally and for others so that they know how to access these resources and services that we share. Today, again, we wanna appreciate all of the partners who have joined us in the webinar and some of them today, you'll be able, if you have questions about healthcare, about <clears throat> healthcare services and healthcare enrollment, Jim Melanowski is here, Katie Baster is here from GHS to talk about some mental health issues if you have questions about that. And of course, Afton Shavers, just giving you a few, Afton Shavers is here from the Greater Flint Health Coalition to also answer questions for you and some of our team in the background ready to make sure your questions get answered. Today, we're going to be talking about really exciting topics. We were asked last week about factors affecting community COVID rates. And we weren't able to get to that in full detail, but we're gonna talk about it a little bit more this afternoon. We're also gonna talk about how to prevent the family spread of COVID. We're looking at COVID reinfections, COVID vaccination rates and, and protocols. And then we will also give you the updates from Genesee County, updates from the governor's office, what we're gonna share with you, uh, Gary's information, and then updates from the city of Flint. Just want to remind you, Gary's not here with us today, but we wanted, he wanted us to let you know, even though he's not here, he is still interested in giving you vital information out of the governor's office. Please call him at 517-282-3193, 517-282-3193, or you can email him at jonesg9 at michigan.gov. Get on his list every day. He's sending out much information about what's happening at the state level for our awareness and understanding. So please join us there as well. I want to invite for our round table today. We're going to start this early because we've got a lot to talk about. Inviting for our round table today, Dr. Deborah Verholden, Dr. Lawrence Reynolds, and of course, Michelle's going to be here. Dr. Hackard is not able to be here with us today, but Michelle from the health department is here to answer questions for you as well. Dr. Verholden and Dr. Reynolds, we were asked a couple of questions last week. I wanna start off with the question about the preventing the family spread. And one of the things Dr. Reynolds, you talked to us about early this morning was that there is an opportunity now for a coming, <laughs> coming for our younger children to get vaccinated. So this is fresh off the press. Can you give us the updates there, Dr. Reynolds? All right, let's back that train up first. Number one, <laughs> if you are 12 and older, vaccine is available for you. And if you wanna take care of yourself and your family, your enemies, your loved ones, your community, your coworkers uh, in the coming days, get vaccinated. All right. Number two, if you travel, if you've been in a crowd, if you've been in a situation where people weren't wearing masks, uh, if you have any question, if you have symptoms, get tested 
and then you'll know. So that's what we can do right now. And so why did I answer that way? And I see my colleague, <laughs> Sister Lewis smiling, because the vaccine is in production. Actually, it's being distributed. It's being set in place, but there is a process. Now, remember when we had a certain president talking about things being warp speed and everybody was saying, oh, that's too fast. They, they're not following procedure. They don't know what they're doing. So now we stick to the process and people say, that's too slow. Folks don't know what they're doing. And the media is giving correct information, but I need to clarify a few things. Number one, the FDA is scheduled to meet on October 26th. And what is today? October 22nd. Okay. Then the CDC's advisory committee on immunization practices is scheduled to meet to discuss this issue on November 2nd through the 3rd. So you see there's a careful process where they decide and approve something. And then the vaccine administration may begin once the CDC director makes a recommendation based on the advisory committee on immunization practice recommendations. So you see, there is a process to protect us, but also to gather all the information. Now, remember I said, they're moving the vaccine supplies in place. So once there's an approval, they can proceed. Okay, right now yeah. Pfizer has been approved. And so you get an idea of how complicated this is. They have two different bottles, one for adult, and that has a purple cap, and the other for, and that's well, 12 and older, and the other for children, five through 11, that has an orange cap. So all these things are being set in place so the right person gets the right dose at the right time in compliance with the official emergency use authorization. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. And you know, I was smiling because we talk about this all the time and things are so rapidly changing. And, and because they're changing, it makes us question whether or not we can trust what's going on in these processes. And I wanted to remind our listeners that a few months ago, we were asking the hospitals and some of our providers like the health department about why we weren't getting the information. And if we called them, we were getting different information from them that we were hearing on the radio or on the TV, on the major news. And you just clarified, sometimes the news again gets out ahead of all the processes that are put in place by the, the, the CDC and those research organizations that are developed and the developers of the, of the actual vaccines. So thank you for clarifying that. And I wanna just make sure when we talk about the availability, Michelle, can, can you give us a, a better sense of when you hear this information from the national news because it didn't get to your desk yet, how do you process it and help us as a community understand how we can be uh, confident in what we're hearing from the health department. So we review everything. We look at the CDC, the APIC, looking through uh, with MDHHS, looking at the guidelines, what potentially would be coming out. Um, as uh, Dr. Reynolds um, perfectly explained, we look at all the dates and um, anticipated um, information that will be, you know, that could be provided. And we work on um, flyers and um, information, um, PSAs, different things that can be provided on the website and um, flyers to give out, possibly talk to the news and radio stations based on the information and how it's coming. But before we give out too much information, we want to make sure we understand what all the guidelines will be. and. In addition to what Dr. Reynolds says, we also have to make sure that once it's approved at the federal level, APIC, uh, all the recommendations and the guidelines, we also have to come see what the um, MDHHS or the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, what their guidelines and approval, uh, they have to approve the guidelines at the state level. So we can't give it out until we get those guidelines. 
will often ask, well, why aren't the pharmacies and the national chains and why are they giving out things before you? Well, they're, they're using the national guidelines and oftentimes their um, offices or their um, headquarters are based in another state, but we're in Michigan. So we also have to get things approved on the state levels before we can start administering. Thank you, Michelle. And that's so important because one of the things we want to be confident in is that our local health department is looking out for our health and our processes here locally because there are some differences across the states. You know, we go to some states, they don't have the same requirements that we have in the state of Michigan. So we appreciate you looking out for it as a state, as our local community, putting some, some local context to what's being going on nationally. Now, let me ask you this, because you used APIC. I'm not sure if I know what that stands for. So Dr. Reynolds said it, is that the American Pediatric something? What does that mean? <laughs> that is the American Committee on Immunization Practices, which is a part of the, we say CDC, we mean the Center for Disease Control. These are the folks who handle most of the health issues uh, that we deal with in the country and internationally. Your tax dollars at work. So you know, if I hear P, I'm gonna try to put pediatrics in there. With the to you, Dr. <laughs> so we have. You're to right. That out. <laughs> and so, I turn so, the letters around. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. So, so so ACIP is what it is, right? American Academy. Yes. Say yeah. that American again. Advisory Committee on Advisory Immunization Committee. Practices. All right. So we know again that there's somebody else watching out over all of this. It's not just some arbitrary decision that's being made, but there are processes. So let's pay attention to what is going on so that we can make informed decisions. Now, Dr. Reynolds, yes, you, you mentioned too here that uh, children five and 11, you mentioned there's a blue cap, a purple cap, a red cap. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying to us is there are differences in the, in the, the vaccine that children will get and the vaccine that adults will get. Can you help us understand it? Because parents are concerned. If I'm getting this big high dose as a senior, is that the same thing my baby is getting? Uh, and, and that's a good question. Uh, we have heard for Moderna, we have heard, we have not heard the approval. For Moderna, it will be half the adult dose, okay? Uh, we have seen for uh, for Pfizer, it's a 10 microgram dose that will be introduced, which is different than the adult dosage. And, and that's why we have to make sure we don't mix these things up. For adults, it's 30 micrograms with the Pfizer. And this is stuff I, folks think we just make this stuff up as we go along. All of us have been up since 7.30 in the morning <laughs> <laughs> pulling down the latest information. Uh, so, and you can find this information on your own online uh, if you go to the CDC website. Uh, but you see all these little things, the difference in the bottle caps, the difference in the doses, uh, the difference in the syringes and the needles. For children, there will be smaller syringes, and I'm sure the children appreciate there will be shorter needles. And so <laughs> all these things, it's not like flicking on a light switch. And then how it's distributed, and this is Michelle and company's headache, you know, how do we Keep store it properly? How do we distribute it and protect its, its uh, strength? Uh, and uh, how do we supply multiple sites? And I'm glad I don't have that job. <laughs> Dr. Reynolds, as you mentioned that, I, I was on, you talked about early this morning, I was on a, a webinar earlier this morning with Dr. Francis Collins from NIH. And one of the things he spoke about, and, and I, I was really uh, impressed and thankful that he spoke about early on they insisted that the clinical trials were much more diverse than the initial trials for many of these drugs that we are taking. They wanted to be sure that there was a good number of African-Americans, of Latino Hispanics, so that when they came forward with the vaccinations, they would have had evidence of how it affected across these various communities. And so 
it, it, that's even true with children being a part of this. So they would know how much dose was too much or how much was the right amount. And we're still in this learning process. So, you know, we continue to learn from you as you pour through all of that, because many of us even don't know where to go to get this information. So one of the things we're going to do today is we're going to put some, some actual articles in the chat um, for you to look at and go and read some of these places, because one of the things that we want to talk about is, is following the protocols. Who should get vaccinated and who should not get vaccinated? There are some of us in our communities because of health conditions who can't get vaccinated. So, so what's the process there? Again, I know you're going to say I'm repeating myself, Dr. Reynolds, but I'm going to ask you again. Help us out. There are some people who absolutely, because of their, their, their health condition, they can't get vaccinated. Oh, yes. What I would recommend is if you have any question about whether or not you should be vaccinated, call your primary care doctor, call your specialist, or check the CDC website, because it, it does get complicated. So those would be the places I would recommend one starts with. Now, the good news is we're not using a live vaccine. So people who are immunocompromised, who have had chemotherapy, who have had bone, that bone marrow transplants, they don't have the degree of worry about uh, the virus creating more problems for them uh, because we're not using a whole virus. We're not using a live virus. We're just using that mRNA, a piece of a virus that will be rapidly degraded in other words, <laughs> put in the trash uh, by normal cellular function once it does its job to produce antibodies. So then we have categories of people who do get the vaccines. Uh, they've got both doses, uh, but yet they're being encouraged to get that third dose because of their immune compromised system. So here again, we need some additional help on that. I looked at this article, Dr. Reynolds, and I just felt like, oh my God, everybody needs to get the third dose, but that's not true. So, so, but there are certain conditions. And when you read these articles, it'll tell you people who have cancer, chronic kidney disease, or, or as you mentioned earlier, may have had a transplant or either got a, a um, what do they call it when you don't get the transplant, but you get somebody else's blood or their antibodies. Bone marrow bone transplant. Bone marrow transplant, mm -hmm. yes, help us out, Dr. Mm -hmm. I want you to say- For what, sickle what, cell patients. Sickle, there you go, sickle cell. They talk about pregnant women here. So there are a lot of things, a lot of places where we wanna have people just think about what these options are, but look at your own health situation to make the best decision. And I'll refer to Dr. Furholden's uh, theme, make a plan. Think it through, write it down, <laughs> give yourself your deadlines to call somebody, to check with an authoritative, credible source, uh, and then find out what you can do locally and ask Michelle and act on it. <laughs> and you just threw the ball to Michelle because Michelle, I'm coming back to you, yes because the health department, you're here to help us as well. So, so talk to us about what ways you encourage people. What, when they call the health department, what are you asking? Because sometimes people show up at the sites and there's a person from the health department giving the vaccines and they ask all these questions. What do you say? So we, when they come in, we usually have a form. Oftentimes we ask them to fill it out in advance. Um, most of the time people don't, so we provide it to them on site and it has numerous questions on there. For example, have you had a vaccine? Have you had um, reactions to, uh, uh, have you had a COVID vaccine? Have you recently had COVID, for example? Um, have you had reactions to certain types of uh, immunizations or possibly um, something that may be, you know, contained in the, um, in the vaccination, um, you know, it's age and um, different things like that. You know, are you a minor? <laughs> you know, can you can you actually sign up for this? So we just ensure that we um, are asking them the questions. Um, 
if there are concerns about something that's on the form or a question that we ask, there have been times where we had to tell people based on your current condition or based on your history, you have to go to your physician or possibly get your uh, vaccination um, with your physician or possibly in a medical care facility where you can be watched closer. So there have definitely been situations where we couldn't, be kept based on um, something in someone's history, it wasn't wise for us to give them a vaccination, for example, at a drive clinic. Um, they needed to be where they could be watched a little closer in case something happened. Thank but you for people are aware <laughs> of that already and try to slide it through. <laughs> so. Well, again, and Michelle, that's one of the reasons why we do want to talk about it here because there are, are health workers and social workers who can help us get this message out and get it out clearly. It's not that when you go to these, these sites, it's just, we say, we got these community sites, everybody should go and get a vaccine. Then you get there and they say, well, maybe not this time. We don't want anybody to be discouraged, but we do want them to understand we're really trying to follow the proper protocols and ensure their safety. Exactly. Uh, Dr. Reynolds, this is, I want to get this one in. It's in the in the Q and A. How do we help citizens who are now afraid? Because Johnson and Johnson is advised to mix and match, and that can be seen to signal lack of confidence, even though it's just a different type of, of vaccination. Because you you know there's one that's the mr they're using the m mRNA, and then there isn't. How does this? You know we need some help here. All right. I will tell you what I know based on official communication, because I am not a vaccine researcher. I'm a primary care physician who depends on the information that comes out of NIH. Yes, uh, mix and match is safe and appropriate. There have been studies that have been done. Uh, if you give uh, the Moderna vaccine, you'll have a boost of, oh, uh, of your immune, your, your, auto your antibodies, you'll have a boost there. And if you get the Pfizer, you'll have a boost. And interestingly enough, you get a stronger boost in your antibody levels from those two vaccines than you would if you got a booster with the Johnson and Johnson. However, you know how we used to say, uh, get in where you can fit in? Okay, if there's a vaccine available and you need a booster, get it. And who needs a booster? Well, there's people my age, 65 and older. There's 18 plus who live in group settings, long-term care settings, the homeless shelters, or people 18 and over who have underlying medical conditions. But then we got to break it down to the community level. If you're a first responder, a healthcare worker, a firefighter, uh, a police, uh, if you work in a nursing home or any or a shelter, if you're a teacher, support staff or daycare workers, if you're a food and agricultural worker, manufacturing worker, corrections worker, post postal service workers, and I, I love my postal service, especially when they're bringing me a check, public transit workers, that means school bus, uh, that means airlines, uh, if you're a grocery store worker, you see, we have to, when we talk about essential care workers, we're all not in the hospital. Yeah. And, and so, so these are the folks. So you raise another point. I wanna bring out these two terms because we hear these terms talked about a lot. One is susceptible and one is vulnerable. And in that list you gave <laughs> are both. So can you just kind of make a distinction? What's susceptible and then vulnerable? Cause the healthcare workers may, be relatively healthy, but they are vulnerable because they're exposed more often. So help us. Now, are you talking to me about unvaccinated healthcare workers? Oh, or are you Dr. talking to Reynolds. me about healthcare workers who are due for a booster? So okay. Dr. Reynolds, come on, you gotta <laughs> make that, you're right, let's make it clear. Okay, if you are not vaccinated, you are susceptible, okay? Uh, if you are vaccinated and in need of a booster because of your special situation, you are susceptible. Okay, so uh, and and this comes up a lot. There there are people who uh, refuse to get vaccinated regardless of their being first responders or in these 
in these work situations or life spaces where they need that protection. Uh, and we have to keep encouraging them or and keep talking to them. But then there's the flip side, and I have to bring this up. If you're working in these settings and you refuse to get vaccinated, if you have a loved one who has these conditions that make them more vulnerable and you refuse to get vaccinated, my question is, do you really care and love for the love those people? And should you really be uh, in that occupation? I know it sounds harsh, uh, but the pandemic is no game. Yeah, Dr. Reynolds, you just you just stepped into a really, really challenging space for a lot of people um, because they're saying, I love them, but I still have some concerns personally about getting the vaccine. Um, some some really want to know, does it mean they're a bad person because they, they don't get the vaccine? Or if they don't, should they just take that extra precaution? When you say take that extra precaution. What I mean is doing those necessary things, masking up, wearing oh, yes. the gloves, socially distances, doing those protocols that can help keep people safe in the event that they're not vaccinated. And, and those are things that are still appropriate for vaccinated people uh, because we have these variants. And why do we have these variants? Because we don't have sufficient numbers of people vaccinated uh, who are having contact with other people. So if we can get as many people vaccinated as possible, we can reduce the development of variants. I did not say eliminate it because a virus is a living thing and it evolves uh, and it comes back to we are living things and we must evolve and yeah. so i'm not saying they're bad people what i'm saying is okay if you've seen somebody on a vent for days or weeks if you've seen someone with long covid if you've seen someone remain in the hospital for weeks or months as they recover, uh, if you've been to funerals, uh, you know, that's telling you something, especially when you realize most of the people who have had these problems have not been vaccinated. Yeah, and we are here in the hospital say that the largest percent of individuals that are in hospitals in the ICU or on in, in, incub intubators or being intubated uh, are those who are not vaccinated. So, so let me ask you this quick question, Doc, is from one of our community health workers. Um, their ability to mix Johnson & Johnson with others doesn't mean that Johnson & Johnson is weak or ineffective. They wanna know so they can make sure that they're sharing appropriately with the community. That's a good question because there's different types of immunity. There's Humoral immunity, that means from antibodies, you know, it's in the blood, in the flow. And then there's cellular immunity, which means there are parts of your body that have cells that are primed, triggered, and ready to go to stimulate the production of antibodies, but also to attack cells that have been infected or attack the virus. So uh, there's two parts. And so antibodies, they're an indicator, but they don't tell the whole story. So don't hesitate, <laughs> you know. Right, all right, M Michelle, I wanna give you one more uh, opportunity before we have to shift from this segment from a health department perspective. What, when we talk about, uh, I just wanna talk a little bit about this community uh, and family spread. What, what and you when we talk about testing and the things that families can do, what, what's your recommendation for us today? So within, you know, minimize the gatherings. Um, definitely. That's tough. Hopefully, right? <laughs> yeah, minimize the <laughs> gatherings, um, or at least maybe have some of them outside. Um, be aware of people are vaccinated and unvaccinated. At a minimum, you know, wear masks um, to protect each other. Um, with... Uh, in addition to that, you know, hand washing is key. If you have someone that you know has COVID and is in the house with you, if at all possible, try, if you have more than one bathroom, maybe have them go, the ill individual use a particular bathroom. 
Um, sometimes we recommend that, um, you know, you do wear masks um, in the house. If you have someone there that's ill, try to um, minimize contact or not to contact that ill individual. Hopefully there's separate rooms that they can remain in most of the time. In times where they have to be in um, communal areas, uh, make sure that they uh, are masked, that you're masked. Uh, when they do go to the bathroom, we usually um, recommend like some type of sanitizer wipe. Of course, age appropriate, make sure that if you, if you know, there's a child or something using that they are aware and you know, that it's safe and that they understand how to use it properly, but keep, um, we would say keep a uh, sanitizer wipes or something in the kitchen areas where people um, come, where a lot of people go in the restrooms area so they can wipe down the sinks, the handles, um, the, um, the handles to the toilet, the doors, the sink, um, as they wipe out the last person that's in there and possibly someone as soon as they go in so that you can minimize the spread, so. Thank you, and I, I do, I have one more question for you, Dr. Reynolds, as a pediatrician. And then I'm gonna just say, there's a couple of other questions. We're gonna have to bring them back next week to talk about what the protocols are, protocols are for even testing once people are identified as being close contact with someone who has been who has been tested positive, but they've been vaccinated or they haven't been vaccinated. So many questions out here. But Dr. Reynolds, thinking about this family spread, there are babies who are, when I say babies, young youngsters who we are now seeing more of them infected as a result of being in school. Parents are struggling, grandparents are struggling trying to figure out how to handle this. Just one more tip for the families, for the moms or the caregivers of these children because they have to feed them, they have to bathe them and clothe them. As a pediatrician, what would your um, recommendations be? And you're on mute, Dr. My number one recommendation is if you're not vaccinated, get vaccinated. If you're not fully vaccinated, complete it. If you start off with J&J, &J, uh, cause of your mobility or your work situation, that's okay. And when the booster comes out and you're eligible for it, get it. And that applies to people 12 and older in your household. And everything you said uh, outlines a very difficult situation and it's occurred in my family. Uh, I have a grandson who started preschool and within the first week uh, he had contact, he was COVID positive, uh, and then one of the family relatives uh, got COVID. Uh, so what do you do? If you're symptomatic, don't wait, get tested. If the test is negative, or if you don't have symptoms from the get-go, around three to five days after that contact, get tested. If you still have a question because you have symptoms, get tested again. You know, uh, as I've told you before, at my testing site, even though I've been fully vaccinated without the booster, people know if I go out of town, I'm showing up in three to five days. And, and then you really need to limit the number of people who come in the household. And this is hard work. Imagine being a single mother or a working parents working different shifts having to address this. Uh, but this is, this is the way it is and, and yeah. we have to work through it. Uh, and, but the key is prevention. If you can get vaccinated, get vaccinated. If you can get the booster, get the booster and then add all those other layers that Michelle laid out so clearly. And if you don't have access to some of these things, uh, if you are positive for COVID or you have someone in isolation in your household, the Greater Flint Health Coalition uh, can be contacted and they will deliver a, an ice, we call it an isolation packet to your household. So there are folks ready to help you. And if you have any question, you call Michelle's people anytime. The health department is ready to answer those questions. Now, Michelle is, is smiling. 
Uh, did you have one last, I'm gonna give that one last minute before we go, because uh, we're gonna hear about where all these testing sites are, as well as the vaccine sites in just a moment from, Michelle, from Sherelle. But I wanted to just, since Dr. Reynolds kind of threw you back the ball, <laughs> let's let's get that out, because I see you smiling. No, I was just, I was just um, thinking, yes, please get vaccinated if you can. Um, if you have questions or you you have concerns, feel free to contact us here at the health department. There are many organizations out there that can answer those questions, speak to your doctors um, and you know the pediatricians for the children. And um, we're here to answer any questions um, that you have. And if we can't answer them, we will search them out or we will direct you to the right individuals. But vaccination is the key for all of us. If you are an individual that is that hasn't been vaccinated and you're still thinking about it, please at least use the mitigation measures, the mask to protect yourself, mask to protect other people, hand washing, and um, you know, minimize gatherings or no gatherings, please. Thank you so much. Dr. Reynolds, Michelle, thank you so much. Appreciate your, your input and your guidance, your insights, and let's just continue to encourage each other to make the best possible decisions that we can based on the information that we have for ourselves and our family. Sherelle is yeah. here to give us the update from the health department, what's going on as far as additional testing sites for this week, where are we in terms of our county status? Good afternoon, everyone. So right now uh, we continue to push efforts to get our community vaccinated. We're right under 360,000 doses that have been administered throughout Genesee County. And so we're seeing those numbers increase weekly and that's a great thing. And that leads me to be able to say that uh, we're seeing a decrease in our positive cases in the last week. So our uh, case trends have went down a little bit, but we're still in high transmission. So we still encourage everyone to continue to seek uh, vaccines and to continue wearing your mask and avoiding large crowds. Next slide. And as you all know, uh, Pfizer has been approved for the booster dose and we have started administering that as of September 29th. And then recently the ACIP and the CDC did approve Moderna and Johnson & Johnson for a booster dose. But as said before by Dr. Reynolds and Michelle, there is a process, so we have to get information, guidelines, and things put in place through Michigan MDHHS before we can start at the local government level administering Moderna and Johnson & Johnson uh, booster doses. And then, of course, if you are immunocompromised, we do offer a third dose for both Moderna and Pfizer, but you have to fall under the guidelines of being immunocompromised and those who are immunocompromised after you receive your third dose, you can also receive a booster dose six months after you complete the three dose series for being immunocompromised. Next slide. So I do wanna let you know where you can get your shots in the upcoming week. Uh, all the listings with the red asterisk are always there and in effect. So on Tuesday, we're at Our Lady of Guadalupe from 12 to 2 p.m. And we'll have Moderna and Pfizer. We'll be at Central Church of the Nazarene on Wednesday from 10 to 12, where we'll have all three of the vaccines. And we'll be doing a pop-up clinic right downtown at the University of Michigan at the William, William S. White building. And that's that building right in front of the great big parking lot in front of Rally. So if you don't know, that's where the White building is. And from 11 to 1 p.m. we'll be there with all three vaccines. And our Thursday clinic for the evening, if you can't make it to any of the earlier uh, clinics, 
we're at Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church, and that's from 3 to 6 p.m. And there we have Moderna and Pfizer. So we do encourage you to come to one of those places and get your first vaccine, your second, if you're immunocompromised, your third, and if you need a booster for Pfizer, we're there. And also, uh, in order to make sure that our numbers aren't going up and that we're headed in the right direction, we need you to go get tested. It's always important to be tested if you've been in large crowds or um, not wearing your mask and not taking those precautions needed to avoid uh, the spread of COVID. So on the screen, I have some sites listed throughout the community where you can go get a free COVID-19 test. We have Word of Life Church, Bethel United Methodist Church, and Macedonia Baptist Church. I do want to point out that those three churches also offer the COVID-19 vaccine. They have Pfizer at those three churches. So you can go there, get you a test and a vaccine. There is rapid testing and PCR testing. And then you can also visit Hamilton Community Health Network, as well as some of the local Rite Aids and Walgreens within the community. If you visit our website at gchd.us, there is a list of Rite Aids and a list of Walgreens that have testing free to the public. Next slide. And then also, as always, we wanna make sure that our homebound citizens know that we are here for them too. So we can uh, get out to their homes and give them a vaccine as well. And if you need uh, any assistance with setting that up, give the health department a call at 810-344-4800, or you can visit us at gchd.us slash forward slash vaccine scheduler forward slash. And We'll get to you. Sherelle, before before you leave us uh, in this segment, just want to just remind us one of the things that we talked about uh, last week was that there are times when people have been exposed and they're not sure they're having symptoms and they're not sure whether or not they should get the vaccination. And I think the recommendation was, even though you go to the site, make sure that you allow that time between your exposure to be sure that you haven't uh, actually contracted the virus. So you may need to get tested and then wait another couple of days because we know sometimes people will go right away when they find out they were exposed and get a test, but they may not have been really uh, clear that they're not positive. So we wanna just make sure you give yourself that time that you need in order to be sure that you don't have the virus. Because yes. if, you get that, if you get that vaccine and you have the virus, something's gonna happen, right? <laughs> Yeah, you're going to be sick for sure. So we do um, ask that you wait at least three days after a known exposure before going to get the test. And that way, um, the test results are more likely to be accurate. And then you can take the proper precaution from there as far as isolation and quarantine goes. Thank you, Sherelle. We're going to ask everybody, make sure you come back next week because we're going to talk a little bit more about that just to be sure because it continues to be a question that people are asking. Thanks so much, Sherelle. Uh, Thank now we're going to hear from the city of Flint. Uh, Kiana Williams is, is, is here with us today and uh, she's going to give us an update for what's happening at the manager of public health for the city of Flint. Good afternoon, Kiana. Good afternoon. Hello, Flint. Um, all right, so I am going to start with, we've got a couple feel-good stories, and I really love the feel-good story, so we'll start there. First with the story about Flint Park Lake. Uh, most of the community probably knows it as Devil's Lake, but the proper name, Flint Park Lake, you may have seen this story on ABC 12 last week where uh, for the last 20 years or so, that community has been experiencing a good deal of uh, flooding. A lot of residents have uh, complained of flooding. Um, and the city of Flint's sewer department under the leadership of Jiggy Mitchell uh, was finally able to resolve that issue in September. Uh, they were able to determine the cause of it, which was a drain that had been uh, backed up with debris um, for probably those 20 years that they weren't able to able to discover what was happening. And they cleaned all of that uh, ickiness out. 
Um, and the residents in that community are very well pleased by the come out of that. Um, they've now, the sewer department has now put that uh, particular drain on their regular maintenance schedule uh, so that they can continue to maintain that area and those residents don't experience any more flooding. So um, just a shout out to uh, the sewer department uh, and for Jiggy Mitchell for his leadership and determination in figuring out uh, how to get that issue resolved for the residents. Awesome. Um, on last evening, uh, the city of Flint honored 11 uh, faith-based organizations for their leadership during the COVID-19 crisis. Those faith-based leadership organizations, those leaders and their organizations were selected uh, by nominations. Uh, and they included Dr. Tommy uh, McDonald. I, I'm so used to just calling him Pastor Tommy. I've never said his name before uh, over at Asbury United Methodist. Uh, also uh, the leaders of Our Lady, our Lady of Guadalupe uh, and Word of Life Christian Church where the pastor is George Wilkerson. Uh, and so it sounds like the celebration went really well last night. Congratulations to those organizations, but above everything else, thank you to those organizations and every single organization that has served the city of Flint during the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, just an update on trick-or-treating. Uh, the city of Flint has uh, established some safety measurements that we'd like to share with the community. Uh, on October 31st, we invite our young people to go out into the community and trick or treat from 4.30 to 7. Uh, go out and get your snacks uh, for residents. Um, that means that you may have some individuals or our young people come in door to door for trick or treating and uh, we encourage them to wear their masks in addition to their masks. <laughs> uh, while they're out having fun. Uh, homeowners, if you are able to place the candy out on a table uh, on your porch or in the front of your home, uh, we do encourage you to do that as well. Uh, and all families are just encouraged to celebrate Halloween by attending uh, events that follow those COVID safety restrictions. Uh, an update on the secondary water pipeline project. Uh, the pipeline is currently working at a 50-50 water blend uh, and all the valves and the meter calibrations, uh, all of the uh, updates have been completed. There were some, um, those were some things that may have been covered last week. Um, just an update that uh, those updates have been completed and the project is ongoing. And then finally, just a reminder, there are two Sundays left for the uh, food truck Sundays downtown Flint at the flat lot. Uh, that happens on October 24th, this Sunday, and then finally on Halloween Sunday. Uh, and it's from three to six, um, again, right downtown South Saginaw on East First Street. So we encourage you to come out uh, and support those small businesses. Thank you, Yvonne. Well, thank you so much, Kian. I just got one other quick thing I want to ask you because I know I've received some calls from community members last week, and I guess this is another uh, feel good, but they were given the number 7667202 to call if they had issues with their water. And I was happy to report that they got a good response. I tried it myself and it works. So I want to thank you and those that are working down at City Hall to make sure that the water department is responsive to our citizens. Many people are still having some challenges with their water, but we want to let you know, you can call this number 766-7202 and you will get a response. Yes, yes. Thank you for sharing that as well. Uh, one important note uh, for residents, I just saw a story on the news this morning that our area is going to have to start using the area codes uh, as well in order to get our telephone calls out uh, beginning Sunday. So we'll add the A1 note to that uh, and the water department is happy to, to promptly support you. Thank you so much, Kiana. And thank you to those who are working to make sure we can still get our questions answered as it relates to our issues with our water. So we're going to go to the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions, our policy brief. Good afternoon, Mary Catherine. 
Hi, thanks. It's always good to be here with you guys. Um, I'm going to cover everything for, for Dr. Furholden today. So I'm going to take it back um, and just kind of build a little bit off what Sherelle was saying. So there were some important pieces of data I did want to mention. So first, um, we are in Genesee County outpacing the outpacing new cases as far as rates, well, as far as rate, our rates of infection go. So the state is at about two, at least the last time we checked was about 292 cases per 100,000 individuals, while Genesee County Health Department was showing about 332 per 100,000 individuals. So, you know, it's always great when we see an increase or, or I'm sorry, a decrease in a plateau, but we still want to be, you know, so mindful about um, our other numbers, right, and, 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 and what they mean as well including the positivity rate. Um, so right now we're at, at about 16%. Uh, That's up from last week. And I also want to point out it's an, also an increase from what the state's positivity rate is, which is at about 11%. Um, so we kind of see, um, you know, we use both the rates and the positivity rates in conjunction to know that overall the state is doing better than Genesee County. So we definitely want to keep reiterating those safety protocols and make sure everyone does um, what they need to do to have a very safe uh, uh, Halloween. Um, so one thing I do want to say is that part of that plateau that we've seen is uh, part is 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 part of the fact that we've seen a decrease in testing. So we also wanna make sure that people are getting tested as a function of exposure and not just any COVID-like symptoms. Um, so with regard to what we've seen as far as our cases by, um, by breakdown that um, disaggregated from the Genesee, uh, from our disparities dashboard, we've seen about a 12% increase in total cases in the county. And then when we take a look at Flint, that increase changes to about 30%. And what's concerning here is we know that once data is added retroactively and we do get our lag cases in on next Monday, we're gonna see those rates increase. Um, uh, as much as I'd like to say, right, that they'll they'll be smaller. So fingers crossed, but we anticipate these these percentages to be larger by next week. Um, and then I just will go ahead and um, give that reminder again about safe, um, safely trick or treating this Halloween. So of course, anyone who can and is eligible to get vaccinated. We definitely encourage that, um, but for those who can't, it's just that I want to reiterate that importance of um, that, that Kiana said, wear your mask with your masks, wash your hands, um, and uh, uh, avoid parties and large gatherings. And if there are many children at a doorstep, uh, we of course encourage parents to have them wait back until, until uh, there's some, some clear spots. Uh, just to keep everyone safe. So there is some pretty exciting pieces of policy to discuss. Um, so there were uh, some new bills in both the House and Senate that were fast-tracked along party lines this week that would essentially create a new uh, voucher program. And the issue with, our, with, with any voucher programs is number one, they are unconstitutional in Michigan. You cannot divert public uh, funding to private and religious schools, um, but another piece of that too, is whenever you are talking about diverting any public funds into education, it fosters inequity in our public school systems. And we already know uh, that that right be because of the pandemic, economic disparities and funding and education have been brought to light. And so we just really want our legislators to consider that um, Right to con to consider what what's what our priorities should be right now, um, when we already know that there's pre existing disparities related to economics. Um, the, our best our best bet is not to further that with with additional legislation that would um, that would undercut public funding for schools. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is a recent effort 
to strengthen the 1931 abortion ban that is on the books right now in Michigan. Right now, that is superseded by Roe v. Wade. However, and we've talked about this a couple weeks ago, there has been, um, you know, there is a possibility that we could see that piece of legislation overturned. So, um, so, so these new policies that have been put forth actually strengthen that 1931 law by putting more restrictions on the bans and actually making it so that if individuals do seek an abortion, uh, it is now a, it would it would be um, a, a felony, um, and with uh, individuals could face at least up to two years in prison, and a, as well as a fifty thousand dollar fine. So we know that uh, we need safe options. Uh, we need we need safe options uh, for for women in healthcare and anything but providing those, uh, it, it, it really strips away the autonomy of women's rights um, to healthcare decisions, right? Um, I also want to point out that literature and studies shows that states with these kinds of regressive anti-choice policies have some of the highest maternal and infant rates of mortality, and the rates of death are even higher for women of color. So we encourage the, 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 um, the sponsors behind these bills to really focus on the proposals that protect, um, protect what women's rights rather than, than limit them. Mary Catherine, thank you so much. I have a quick question for yeah. you from the chat, uh, from the Q&A. Can you give some additional information on what the voucher program actually is under the education program? Yeah, so so basically what it is, is it, it's I, I, I kind of call it a voucher program in disguise. So basically, it's a new proposal to fund private education with donor money. And right. So so essentially, any contributions made by a donor to a to a private or religious school would be 100% tax deductible. So that would mean hundreds of millions of dollars less when it comes to tax revenue um, for, for the state of Michigan. And I do just wanna point out, um, just because I have some numbers in front of me that we're talking about in the first year, should this legislation go through, it would most likely to be vetoed, but as much as $500 million in the first year. Um, so if, if, if you can only just take a few minutes and imagine what would that mean for our public schools. Um, so so um, this legislation is, you know, we 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 hope that it is a non-starter, um, but at, we'll we'll of course find out that will unfold as it makes its way through the legislature. Thank you so much, um, yeah. Mary. Because part of the purpose of this policy brief is to show and really elevate the clear cl and clarify the inequities that we often see and how it affects our community. So we appreciate you putting that information together for us. We again are so happy that you all have joined us for our webinar today. We wanna remind you that if you are a community health worker or a social worker, we want you to continue to apply for these continuing education units and contact hours. We see you, we know you're here. And so we wanna make sure that you have the benefit based upon your request to get continuing education units and social work credit. So please, if you have any questions about whether or not your process is going forward, contact Mary Catherine Crawford at crawf457 at msu.edu. And we tell you every week again, I'm gonna repeat myself as we thank you for joining us. There are many, many ways that you can join and be a part of the webinars. And I just wanna ask you to continue to like us on Facebook uh, at facebook.com backslash HFRCC or subscribe to our YouTube channel at Healthy Flint. You can, may also email us any questions or if you need more information, please feel free to contact us at info at HFRCC.org or please feel free to give us a call at 810-835-2130. Now, a quick pause, something's coming up. We're gonna have some, some change in our timing and in a couple of weeks and that 
email, I mean, that uh, that preface, that 810, that area code has to be on any calls that you make. So if you're going to be making calls in the next couple of days, make sure you put the area code on. I want to also say thank you again to each of you. In the next few weeks, you'll be hearing us give some special appreciation to our partners and some of you. We're watching and we know who you are. Uh, and we want to let you know how much we appreciate the fact that you're sharing information that you received from the webinar and that you're also utilizing the information. I had a quick opportunity myself. I forgot my, I'm in Denver and I forgot my immunization record, but I remembered on this webinar, we could go to the portal and find it. And I was able to do that so I can get in the convention center without a problem. So this information that you're getting is valuable and it's useful right now. So again, let me say again, continue to join us each week. We'll be back here next, next Friday at the same time. And want to remember that you encourage, encourage you to encourage somebody else to join us in these webinars so that the information we share can go beyond our individual uh, in, uh, knowledge. So we'll see you next week right here at the Flint Community Webinar on Coronavirus, sponsored by the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center. Thank you and have a wonderful weekend.